Okay, uh, real time programming 2018 week 8. Today we're going to look at a um, technique for detecting um, motion in video. And this is this is a really useful technique for incorporating interaction um, into some sort of system using just a webcam. Um, you can also use it to detect motion on pre-recorded video. It has a lot of uses. It's a very, very useful technique just to have in your arsenal so that you can inject interactivity um, with uh, not very many resources needed. You know, cheap, cheap webcam will do the job. Um, so the technique uh, that we're going to look at is um, called frame differencing. Um, it, it's quite a simple technique and uh, to show you how it works I'm just going to jump over to uh, Pixelmator. So um, what we've got here um, I'm sort of faking two frames of an animation. So frame one, frame two, we've got this happy little ghost and say in, a, in the first frame the ghost is over here and then next frame the ghost is over here. And by comparing these two frames, so um, for example, comparing one frame to the previous frame, we can um, look for changes in those frames and, and the changes that we find will be evidence of motion. Um, so the way that we do this with this technique is by using um, frame differencing. Frame differencing, if you're um, coming from like a um, video or image editing um, uh, world, then uh, frame differencing you can think of as a compositing mode or a blending mode. Um, here, so let's call this frame 1 and frame 2. If we um, composite frame 1 on top of frame 2 using a difference blending mode, we get this. And so uh, what this is, is um, the resulting image of compositing these two frames together with a difference blending mode. And the result is that we have an image where anywhere those two frames were the same is black and anywhere they are different is white. So uh, the white is an indication of what has changed from one frame to another and an indication of motion. We can take this frame and if we look at how many white pixels are in this frame, it'll tell us how much motion there is. Um, and uh, the other thing we can do is we can take just a little part of this frame and, and find out if there was motion in a particular part of this frame. And you know, you can take it even further if you have a look at certain parts of the frame, you can see if there was motion here and then motion here and then motion here, you can detect movement. Um, more specifically, so you can say something was moving from this direction to this direction. Um, and this is, the, this is the basic technique, so let's look at how we do this in Touch Designer. Um, so let's delete this, I'll step through, I'll start from what is essentially a blank, um, a, a blank canvas, and um, there are a couple of quirks that I want to point out along the way, so just reset things, let's, uh, let's go. So, First things first, we put in a video in a video device in. Now this will give me my webcam. Um, this could just as easily be a movie in top or any other image source. Um, can work on anything that can boil down to a 2D image, or even a um, uh, like 1D image or a single pixel. Um, but image data, we want, we're working with image data in this situation. Um, now, this is great. This is giving us. Uh, I'll just drop a null in here. Bonk, bonk. So, this is giving us um, essentially a stream of frames and it's giving us the current frame. And so, we've got that, that's great. But to make frame differencing work, we need to compare the current frame with the previous frame. Um, now, to do that in um, in Touch Designer, the top that we can use is the cache top. So I'm going to insert an operator and go to the cache top and uh, pop open its settings. Now, what the cache top does is it stores a series of frames and gives you very fast access to them. So it's storing these frames on the graphics card. Um, you know, I. 
I'm not actually sure what the applications of this are. I haven't used it for any other situation other than this. I think people have used it for doing sort of slit scan effects and things like that, but it's just uh, good to know that you can store um, images and access them extremely quickly by storing them on the graphics card. Um, now, as far as the settings go in our cache top, we only need to store the previous frame. Um, so in case size, how many frames do we want to store? I'm going to set that to two. Might be able to get away with one, but uh, I, I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that further. And then the output index is um, what uh, what frame out of those frames that we're storing do we want to access? Um, and in this case, the frame that we want to access is minus one. So the previous frame. Cool. Now. Uh, this is uh, indistinguishable from our initial image because, you know, our frame rate, our um, touch design here is running at 60 frames a second and that's imperceivable, those differences. Um, but what we now have is this video device in one. This is um, the most recent frame. And then this cache coming out of this cache top is the previous frame. Um, and that's what we need to do our frame differencing. So. I'm going to insert a difference top. This difference top works exactly the same way as um, as that difference blending mode worked in Pixelmator or After Effects or Photoshop or anything. It's essentially just a blend mode. Um, and I'm going to hook my video device into it. So now um, I'm differencing my current frame and the previous frame. and Everything that's white is the difference between those two frames. So look, we've basically done it. We're detecting motion. Now here is quirk number one. Um, you'll notice this is sort of flickery. Now I think, I'm, I'm quite sure that what this is, is um, down here in the bottom left, Touch Designer is running at 60 frames a second. And the camera that I'm using, in this case it's a uh, Logitech C920, but my, uh, my webcam does the same thing, can't provide frames that quickly, or Touch Designer can't access the frames that quickly, or something, but the frame rate of my camera is slower than the frame rate of Touch Designer. So what Touch Designer is doing is when it gets a frame from the camera, it's going, okay, I've got the frame, and then it, uh, one sixtieth of a second it's asking the camera for another frame and the camera hasn't been able to do whatever it needs to do or there's some something's holding something up and we're getting the same frame twice now if you think about it, if you've got this got the same frame and you do a different blend mode and it shows you what is different between those two frames nothing they're going to be the same and so the image that you get is black and so all these little black flickering bits are the result of duplicate frames now in Max MSP and uh, you, uh, a lot of other applications, you have a little bit more fine-grained control over that. So for example, in Max, you can say, just give me unique frames. Don't give me um, frames as fast as you possibly can, just when the frame has changed. Um, I don't know how to do that in Touch Designer. If anyone on the internet knows, please let me know. Um, but my current workaround is this. Just go down to your FPS, and if I set this down to like 20 frames a second, now, um, touch designer uh, touch designer is asking for frames, and my ca camera can keep up. So I've removed those duplicate frames. Now, that's not strictly necessary, um, but down the line, when we start to analyze this and get a um, get a result um, to use for interaction, um, we don't want that always flickering down to zero. Now we can get around that, but this is just the workaround that I'm going to use in this situation. Okay, so that's the quirk of the day. Um, great. Now, we've got this image that is um, showing us a graphical result of motion. This, this itself is useful, right? We could go on to process this image and it already encourages interactivity. You know, it just put some feedback trails and a bit of color on this and people will jump around in front of the camera. It just happens. Um, but if we want to do anything more sophisticated, we want to be able to um, boil this data, boil this movement down to a control signal that we can use to, um, you know, control playback speed of audio or move something in 3D or otherwise um, cause something to happen further down in the system. Um, the way that we can do that is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to use the analyze top. 
I'm just going to pull it out of the difference here. And if I middle click on this, or so mouse wheel click to get up this information, you can see size is one by one. So what this is, is actually a single pixel. And uh, you can see what it's doing here in its options, uh, or its parameters. You can see it's got an operation. What operation do you want to run on this image? And we're averaging. So this is giving the average result of every pixel in this image. Um, but of course, most of this image is black. So the image here on our analyze top is very dark. If I move around a lot, you can sort of see that it starts to flicker. But, um, but it's pretty much just black. That's not that important because uh, we can measure it. So what I'm going to do is um, use a top to chop to convert this pixel into values. And now we have a numerical representation of how much movement is going on in the scene. Um, this is pretty much it. We're pretty much done. Um, there now. This is the easiest way to implement this process, but there are a few other steps that we can do to um, uh, make this a lot more efficient. So if I just come back here, here's my video device in. This is a um, you know theoretically 30 or 60 frame um, video stream that is um, full HD, so 1920 by 1080 pixels, and uh, full color, so red, green, and blue. Um, that's a lot of information, and that's not. We don't need all of this information to um, to detect motion. We can use a. We don't need all that resolution, and we don't need all of that color. So unless you're going to use this as a um, as an image effect, as a way of like uh, um, visually or directly visually representing motion, or just using it as a as an effect then um, we can make this a lot more efficient. Um, the first thing that we can do is drop the resolution. The easiest place to do that is from my video device in. There's also the resolution top if you need to use this in a different situation. For example, if you're using your video at somewhere else in this application, you might want to keep it high resolution. Drop the resolution down using a video top. But in this example, I'm just going to drop my resolution down to 8th. See, it's sort of pixelated. And that's fine, it has virtually zero effect on the um, detection of motion. Um, so if we go down to our top here, you can see that's still doing its thing. Um, the other thing that we can do is, or the other thing that we can get rid of is this color data. We, we, it's, it's just not needed. And so um, with this differencing operation, this is actually running um, differencing for each color in each pixel. So um, however many pixels we have, this is going to tell me, whatever 240 times 135 is, that's our number of pixels. And for every pixel, there are three values. And for each of those three values, it's running this calculation of what is different between this image and this image. That's a, that's, that's a lot of work, and we don't need to be doing all of that work. So um, I'm going to, uh, what we want to do is um, make this image black and white and the operation that we can use to do that is the monochrome operation so we can use the monochrome top um, here monochrome um, and uh, there's one setting that we need to set in this in common in pixel format we want to set this to 8-bit fixed mono so what that's going to do is um, for each pixel in this image, it's just going to represent that as a single number between 0 and 255. Um, and that's all we need. So the differencing is working just as it did before. Our motion detection is working just as it did before. Now, of course, um, this image, our resulting image, is um, one pixel by one pixel format, 8-bit fixed mono, so it's a single color value. And um, that means that our red, green, and blue values are all exactly the same. So we don't need all of them. In our top, um, top to chop, we can get rid of our alpha, blue, green, red, and let's call this motion. So now we've got a value that we can use as a control signal. Um, we can do things like uh, use a map chop 
to uh, put it into a more interesting range. So like if I move around a lot, I can sort of just get it up to um, 0 0.1. So let's change its range from 0 to 0 0.1, or from 0 to 0 0.1, map that into the range 0 to 1. And now we've got a, a much more visible um, or more normalized value that we can use. And from here we could, for example, use a lag. Maybe let's make it take um, half a second to drop down. Mm, 0 0.2 to come up is okay. But now we've sent, now we've got a smooth value that we can use. Um, and finally, let's just look at one other application of this. At the moment, we're detecting um, detecting motion across the entire video. But you can use this in a similar way to um, how you might use a connect. So when using a connect, you might want to put, say, a button that people can touch, right? And you're encouraging this physical movement of them reaching out with their arm and touching a button. But that comes with all the complexity that comes with a connect. So you're needing to, you know, do it. It's capturing a depth image and then processing that, processing that into a skeleton and representing that in 3D space. And then you need to deal with the case where it can't find a skeleton or um, just work with the depth image itself. It's a lot of work. We can do that a lot more simply with um, frame differencing. So um, let's say we want to put a button up here. Well, we can do that simply by cropping our input. So if I crop, just come down here, stick my hand up here so I can see what I'm cropping. Let's crop in on my hand. And now we're only looking, we're only analyzing this part of the video. Um, I'll just bring this up, and I'll bring this up. Get rid of this. Okay, so now we've got a detection of movement in that um in that one spot. Um, you know, you can take your video here. You can apply, for example, a button image. You could overlay a button image to encourage some interaction, and then people put their hand there. You can make something happen. Um, lots of applications for this. It's sort of up to your up to your imagination as how to how you want to apply this. But um, a few simple steps. We've boiled an image down into motion. We've detected that. We've uh, measured that motion and translated that to a control signal that we could then map onto any parameter in any domain that we wanted to. Um, cool. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully, you can find some use for this.